Um, as Courtney mentioned, my name is Bridget Boston, and I serve as the Associate Director of our Department of Public Administration. And I myself am a graduate of the program. I finished up in 2015 with Karen. And I actually also served as president of Pi Alpha Alpha as a student. So glad to see you filling in the shoes, Courtney. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the event, um, and this is our annual career networking event, dubbed Finding Your Vocation in Public Service. So it's great to see so many new and also some familiar faces. Um, as a department, we truly enjoy holding this event every year um, because it allows us to invite our fabulous alumni back to share with us their meaningful experiences and contributions in public service. Um, I'd also like to take this moment to thank Father Richard Jacobs, our Pi Alpha Alpha chapter advisor, for all of his work, to Courtney Morissette, our student and Pi Alpha Alpha student chapter president, for all the hard work that you guys have done for our chapter and um, putting together this lovely panel. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Catherine Wilson, our MPA program director and chair of the department, who could not be here tonight. She's actually prepping her class. Um, and then I'd also like to thank Michelle Griffin, our lovely administrative assistant and incredibly talented photographer who does a ton of work publicizing these events and doing all that work behind the scenes that you don't see to get it together. So thank you all. So tonight this event is also fun functioning as an open house. So we have quite a few prospective students here who are learning more about the Master of Public Administration degree, what it's all about. Um, so fortunately you've come to hear from some great alumni um, to talk about their career paths. Um, it's a great opportunity to network with some of our faculty and also students to learn about their experience in the classroom. The focus of the MPA degree here at Villanova is to offer graduates the knowledge of values, roles, skills, and practices to help them become competent professionals, capable of ethical, intelligent, inclusive, and creative leadership in public service. So our program is fully accredited by the Network of Schools of Public Policy, Affairs, and Administration, otherwise known as NASPA, and our program is designed with the working professional in mind. Um, not only does our program offer classes in the evening, uh, we also offer one credit courses on the weekends, which are much more applied workshop format classes. Um, and we also provide students the opportunity to pursue their degree online. So we have this fantastic on-campus program. We also have it online, and we're fortunate to have one of our students, Matthew, um, from the online program here tonight. Um, so beyond just pursuing the degree generally, you can also focus in a particular area. So we have certificates in city management and nonprofit management. Um, so it's a great opportunity for you to specialize and tailor your interests and your career focus um, through those classes. And we are also fortunate to be supported by a faculty that boasts a wide range of scholarly and teaching interests um, in, and approaches in public administration. Um, and our alumni have enjoyed careers throughout the public sector in federal, state, local governments, as well as nonprofit organizations, and we even have alums in the private sector. Um, so we have a few materials for the program, too, for all of you prospective students who are interested. And um, we actually have another event coming up in October, October 23rd. It's our graduate program open house. So if you have not heard enough about the program tonight, you can come back and learn more um, on October 23rd. Um, and of course, we also invite you to join us by sitting in on one of our classes to learn more about our program. So that's all I'll say right now about our degree and how much I love it. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to welcome Courtney back up here um, to do, introduce our panelists and get us started. So I look forward to talking with all of you after, and thank you again for, for coming. So our first speaker is Karen Baldini, who graduated, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> who graduated from Chestnut Hill College with a, uh, a degree in criminal justice and she served for 28 years in the Philadelphia Police Department. She actually just retired in July um, before she was the Lieutenant of Police, uh, police officer in the Philadelphia Police Department. Now Karen is teaching at Jefferson, a uh, course in emergency services, and also at Delaware Valley, uh, teaching in the Masters of Criminal Justice program, and also serving in the Montgomery Community College Police Department. So Karen. 
we'd love to hear more about your experience All and right. if you take away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I speak a lot, so I don't need a microphone or a podium. Yeah. Actually, I don't like those crutches. <laughs> I like to get out and like, you know, talk to you a little bit. So my name is Karen Baldini. Thank you so much, everybody, for having me. Um, let me briefly say that it is such a pleasure to be back here on campus. I love it here. I really, really do. Um, I can tell you that I uh, recently retired from the police department. I became a police officer in Philadelphia in 1990, okay, pre-Rodney King. So I saw a lot in my career. Uh, and I can tell you that throughout those 28 years, I learned a whole heck of a lot about life and people and human nature. Um, but I can tell you that in, at, at one point in my uh, career in law enforcement, I decided I really need to go get a college degree because I wanted to move up in the ranks, okay? And I knew that it would serve me well. So way back when, actually 1995 or six, okay? I had just been promoted to the rank of detective and Chestnut Hill College offered a free scholarship, like a scholarship to a Philadelphia Police Department employee, a sworn officer. So this message came through our department and my captain at the time, I was assigned to the research and planning unit, which they were policy, uh, so policy writing unit. Uh, my captain came to me and he said, Karen, I really think you should apply for this. And I said, okay, come on. You're going to give this to a commander. Let's not, you know, come on, seriously. He says, no, 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 you are a stellar writer. You really need to apply for this. Make a long story short, yours truly got the full scholarship to Chestnut Hill. So, you know, very shocking, okay? It kind of like sent shockwaves throughout the police department. Oh my goodness, why didn't a deputy commissioner get that? And oh my goodness, why didn't a captain get that? Well, because it was an uh, unbiased, not connected politically to the police department entity that was deciding on who was going to get it. I was up, about, up against about 150 other people for that scholarship. So I was really grateful. That is my one of my first thank yous to the police department is that if it wasn't for the police department, I'd probably be buried in debt for undergrad right now. So I go through my undergraduate program. I decide many, many years later after having two babies, okay, and pursuing additional ranks, I made the rank of sergeant and then went on to make the rank of lieutenant. I had multiple assignments over that time. I was a patrol supervisor, a detective. I sat in that rank for nine years. It was my favorite, okay. Moved on to sergeant, served in the 39th police district as a patrol supervisor on the day shift and also the overnight shift at the time when the 39th police district in Philadelphia was running the city in homicide rates. Probably every night that I worked, I had a homicide scene going. It was absolutely sad and tragic. Fortunately, it's not that way anymore. Fast forward, I get assigned to internal affairs. Served eight years in internal affairs as an investigator. Talk about eye-opening stuff. I can tell you stories you just cannot make up about what people do, whether they have a badge or not, okay? I had a lot of dealings with the legal department. I had a lot of dealings with attorneys, city solicitor's office. Uh, the district attorney's office. I fired police officers. I put police officers in handcuffs. And you know what? I had a very, very, very strong love of that profession. My father was a police officer before me. He introduced me to that profession. And anybody who would tarnish our badge, I had no time for. A lot of people in law enforcement would say, I could never work in internal affairs. I could never, ever, ever arrest a cop. I could never fire a police officer. Well, guess what? Check your integrity scale, okay? Check your ethical scale. Because if you care about what the public thinks of us, because we are public service, you came on the police department to serve other people in the community. If you are okay with a cop slipping and sliding here and there and kind of doing things a little shaky, you shouldn't be on the police department. You should never, if you have that high a level of integrity, ever have a problem with saying, there's the door, sir, because you violated the law or you violated our standards. I did not. I had no trouble with it at all. If they were a piece of garbage, they needed to go. That's really how I felt about it, okay? Just being honest. And a lot of people who worked with me in internal affairs felt the same way. So that's the second thing I thank law enforcement for and the Philadelphia Police Department is that it allowed me to have that experience over eight years of time in seeing law enforcement from a completely different perspective. I got to interview wonderful people who came in with very legitimate complaints and I liked seeing them all the way through, okay? And seeing justice done for those individuals. 
There's a flip side to that coin. I also had to investigate many allegations made against good cops that were completely false. Okay? Human nature occurs in every facet of society, and people can be vindictive. People think that if they come in and file an illegitimate complaint against an officer, it's going to change a judge's mind. The judge could care less about your complaint. That's really the bare fact. So I also had the opportunity not only to bring justice to people who were wronged by a police officer, but also to police officers who had unjust claims made against them. Move forward to where I ended my career. Okay, was elevated to the rank of lieutenant, very grateful for that. During my time as a police lieutenant, I actually came here to get my MPA degree. In 2011, I had a female police captain in internal affairs who was going through her degree program for her master's at Jefferson, or, uh, St. Joe's University. St. I know. St. Joe's <laughs> University. Let me tell you about that for just a second. So she used to bring me her papers all the time and say, Karen, can you read my paper for me? Read my paper for me, just proof it for me. I used to get that all the time from the college students that I worked with. Karen, proof my paper for me. Well, every time this captain would bring me papers, I'm like, what is this class you're taking? This paper makes no sense. Like, what was the point of this? I don't get it. So when I started looking for a master's program, immediately I erased St. Joe's University from the list, okay? And that was not only for my experiences with her, but I knew a lot of police officers and commanders like myself who sought master's degrees and went to St. Joe's. Okay, they do actually a really big program, heavily occupied by Philadelphia law enforcement, not just Philly police, but SEPTA police, uh, the sheriff's department. They get their master's degrees there. They don't have to pass any kind of a test like I did. Okay, there's no comp exam. They don't have to write any kind of a thesis paper. There's nothing. Really, to me, write a check, get your degree. That's what it felt like. I don't know if that's true. I've never sat in a St. Joe's classroom. I'm sure they have some excellent instructors there. But just from my own personal experience with people who've gone there, I chose not to utilize that university. Okay, I feel so strongly about that that I now see tons and tons of ads. People call me all the time, St. Joe's is hiring instructors. St. Joe's is looking for CJ. I will not work for St. Joe's. I won't do it. So that being said, I started to compile a list. What am I looking for in a master's program? I really needed to feed into where my career may be going. Okay. I was still in internal affairs when I was going through this process. I knew a guy by the name of Jim Kelly. He's now a chief inspector in the Philly PD. Okay. At the time, Jim Kelly was Captain Kelly. He and I had a conversation and he said, Karen, hey, I hear you're listening for a you're looking for a master's program. I said, Yeah, yeah. He says, Can I tell you about Villanova's MPA program? I said, sure, tell me. So he and I had a very long, I'll never forget it, we were standing right outside of Internal Affairs in the parking lot, we must have stood there for an hour and a half, and he talked about his love of the program, his love of the school. I immediately had to go to my desk and pull it up on the internet. Started looking all through it, and I said, okay, sign me up, I'm gonna go to an open house. Well, that was it for me. I went to the open house, I'm done, where do I register, where do I apply, I'm good, let's go. So. I go to, uh, I start my classes in Villanova in 2011, okay? I still remember the first class that I took. It was an HR class. Now, right in the beginning of my MPA studies, I was transferred again, okay? I left Internal Affairs, and I was transferred to the Training Bureau, all right? So now I'm in a position to influence the new young police minds. Now I'm in a position to teach and cultivate training programs for them. I took this very, very seriously. I actually asked for that transfer, and it was granted to me by Commissioner Ramsey. So this happened early on in my time here at Villanova. So as I'm proceeding through the program, I'm a couple classes in, I start thinking to myself, how can I tailor my MPA studies to kind of fit what I want to do? I really, really love teaching. Loved it so much, I do it now in my post-police life. But how, did I, how could I use that? I can tell you, the MPA program was so good to me. They said, Karen, if you want to take some classes outside of our program, okay, graduate level stuff, but outside of our program that will kind of like as electives to fine tune how you want your degree to be or how it's going to fit into your career, 
go ahead and do that. So I did. I took classes on adult education outside of the MPA program. Helped me tremendously. And I'll, in a minute, explain how. So I also decided with my MPA degree to not solely focus on city government. Okay? So I dabbled a little in the city government classes. And some of my city government teachers would be like, it really was kind of like a, you know, having like a co-instructor in the class, having Karen there, because she, I had already done 20 years in law enforcement working for city government. So I dabbled a lot in nonprofit. And I'm so happy that I did. And here's, I'll tell you why. In my duties in the training bureau, I worked for, I did some things for the recruit side. Our, our training bureau in the Philadelphia Police Department is divided into two, two major sections. One side is the recruit side. That's the police academy, okay? The other side is called the advanced training unit. That is all of our in-service training, and that's where I was assigned, that's where I asked to go on my transfer request. So here I get to teach two different types of groups of people. Okay, now think about this for a second. You have these brand new hired young folks. Not all of them are young, but most of them are in their 20s. They're like little sponges. Okay, they're like kindergartners, to be honest with you. Okay, I literally could walk into a class of recruit officers and they're sitting there bright eyed and bushy tailed and they just listen to every word you say and every word you say is gospel truth. It's kind of boring after a while, to be honest with you. Okay? The reason why I asked to go to the in-service side of our training bureau is because those are seasoned law enforcement officers, and you can't pull any punches with that. And I loved it, because you had to know what you were talking about and be honest about it and be able to back it up. Because they'll call you on it just like that. Recruits, they don't know any better. It's kind of boring. So in-service folks, I loved teaching that. Why did the nonprofit courses that I took in the MPA program serve me so well? Here's why. While I was in the training bureau, and that's actually where I retired from, while I had my tenure there, one of the um, very one of the things that I did there that I'm very very proud of is I started the naloxone um, deployment program for the police department. Okay, is anybody familiar with what naloxone is or what it's used for? Okay, for those of you that aren't, I'll tell you. I will tell you. You all know that we have an opioid crisis going on in our country. Okay, well, Philadelphia is literally one of the ground zero cities for this problem, okay? In Philadelphia, every police officer is being trained. We're still doing it. We were almost 7,000 people we had to train, including our cell block sheriff's officers and civilian personnel in some locations, such as the chemical lab, the chem lab. Training them all in the deployment of a product called Narcan or Naloxone. Okay, and what that does, I actually heard a police chief from Nassau County say this on the news the other day. And when I heard him say it, I said, oh, that's so wrong. You don't even know what you're talking about. He, he, had to, and he was asked by the interviewer on, on the news, what is Narcan? What is that for? And he said, well, it, it reverses the stupor that a person falls into when they use an opioid. Completely false wrong. That <laughs> is not what Narcan is for, and it is not what Narcan does. What Narcan does is it actually um, changes the uh, biology, okay, of what the drug is doing in the brain. Okay, there's receptors in the brain. That drug, that opioid, binds itself to the receptors in the brain that causes respiration to stop. Okay, so it basically blocks the message through the central nervous system for you to breathe, all, you know, automatically. What naloxone does, or Narcan does, is when you administer that drug intranasally or even intravenously or subcutaneously, whichever have you, what it does is it too binds itself to those same receptors in the brain, restoring respiration, okay? So it does not eliminate a high. It does not take away this drunken or opioid stupor that they have. All Narcan does is restore respiration because if you can't breathe, what do you do? You die, okay? So it gives someone who has suffered from an overdose a second chance. That's all Narcan does, very simple. Other than that, it's a completely harmless drug, okay? So I, with the Philadelphia Health Department, the Philadelphia Fire Department, our EMS director, Dr. C. Crawford Meachum, we got together and we talked about, well, what about putting Narcan in the hands of Philadelphia police officers? Philadelphia was not the first. I can't stake that claim. Actually, Delaware County law enforcement was the first to do it. 
okay? We followed in their footsteps. Delaware County, I have to give them all the credit, they were responsible for going to the State Senate in Harrisburg and actually having things like Act 139, which gives police officers authority to train and administer naloxone, provides them some protections, provides victims of overdoses and the witnesses to those overdoses some legal protections. They were the ones who were instrumental in setting all the groundwork for Pennsylvania emergency services with this. But I'm very proud that I was one of the biggest proponents of and the administrator for the Narcan program in Philly PD. Okay, uh, my successor has taken it over since I have. I'm told the program is still very successful. Here's the problem with the naloxone program. It's really expensive. How do we pay for it? Well, my MPA degree gave me a lot of cool information on how to deal with nonprofit organizations, private sector and acquiring funds for initiatives such as this. So who did I reach out to? Actually, he reached out to me. Has anyone ever heard the name Tuttleman? Well, almost every campus in this area has a Tuttleman building on it. I know Jefferson has a Tuttleman building on it. Mr. Tuttleman, his name is Max Tuttleman. He's actually a grandson of the two famous Tuttlemans who used to be in the textile industry in Philadelphia, okay? So Google Tuttleman, you will see, very, very prominent name in Philadelphia. Very, very wealthy family. Actually, his father, I believe, is now getting into the marijuana growing business way out in Colorado. Go where the money is, right? So Mr. Tottleman reached out to me and he said, hey, listen, Lieutenant, I'm really interested in this Narcan program you're running. Is there any way that I can help? And I said, you know what, sir? More than anything, I need money. I don't have money to put Narcan in the hands of cops. Every dose of Narcan that a police officer uses costs me almost $40. One dose, one dose, four milligrams, 40 bucks. He says, wow, that's really expensive. He sat in my office up at the training bureau for about two and a half hours one day, and I showed him all of my records. I kept very, very meticulous training records. I kept purchasing records. Coming out of our, our central budget for the police department, it was not a line item. To this day, Narcan is not a line item on the police department budget. My deputy commissioner back in Philly PD has sat in front of city council three times. We started the program in 2015. My first Narcan hit the streets of Philadelphia in Philadelphia police officer hands on January 24, 2015. I was getting ready to graduate from the program. That funding for that program, now remember, they want to put it in the hands of every cop. 40 bucks a dose. You do the math. Does that require a line item? Sure it does. That's a huge budgetary item. They still are having issues with paying for that product. Now we've gone, I have garnered uh, negotiations between Department of Public Health and the pharmaceutical companies that supply the product. I was very privileged to be involved in that. They were very helpful, the pharmaceutical companies. Actually, the company that gives us our Narcan now is called Adapt Pharma. They're right out of Radnor, PA. They're across the street from Archbishop Carroll High School, right around the corner from here. Um, additionally, I was also on the um, Naloxone Task Force for Mayor Kenny, okay, as a voice for public health and law enforcement. So there was a law enforcement and like a criminal justice section for that task force they asked me do you want to be on that and i said no 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 i want to be on the public health task force i want to work with the grassroots organizations that are in the 24th district which is ground zero for opioid overdoses in philadelphia i want to work with them okay i want to work with all of those people that are out walking the streets helping these people that are that are doing this job and overdosing and now because of sitting a, a law enforcement officer on that particular committee, now we have paramedics and police officers together responding to overdoses, which is amazing. We're not the only city that's doing that. New York's doing it, Boston's doing it, a lot of big cities are doing it. It took Philadelphia, a they were a little slow on the uptake, but they did eventually get that accomplished, which is really great. Because if you have somebody who is suffering from an overdose and they don't have the equipment or the skill set, 
to save this person, a police officer, all they have, they have CPR knowledge and they have Narcan. That's it. Okay? But they need more intervention than that. You need a paramedic there. You need somebody there who can transport quickly. And now we're doing that, which is amazing. So my MPA degree helped me in so many ways with what I would be tasked with down the road with the naloxone program. Okay? It helped me with dealing with the NGOs that I had to work with. It helped me in dealing with the other public sector entities that I had to talk to. It helped me in dealing with EMS and the hospitals. I had a great relationship with a lot of different people from a lot of different sectors doing really good work. If you can pulse things like that out of your MPA degree, you really hit, hit the nail on the head. Look for those things when you're in your classes because they will serve you well if that is the kind of work you want to do. I found it incredibly rewarding and I would highly recommend it to anybody. The next thing I will tell you that the MPA degree helped me with is it helped me with my writing skill. In, my, in the police department, in the training bureau, I became the curriculum writer <laughs> for the department. That being said, yes, I did write a two-hour block of instruction on Narcan. That was adopted by multiple police agencies across the Commonwealth, as well as our state police training commission. I work for them as well in my retirement. I've also worked on procedural justice curriculum. Has anyone heard of that concept, procedural justice? It's kind of like a buzzword now in law enforcement, okay? But it's actually a really widely accepted, widely taught concept now. It's a strategy, actually, to reduce bias in police, okay? So I did all of the legwork, which if I hadn't gone to Villanova, I probably would have been lost in the sauce trying to do all the, the academic educational legwork to learn about procedural justice. Because when my chief inspector came to me, Chris Werder, by the way, there you go. Um, when my chief inspector came to me and said, Karen, I need a class on procedural justice. Commissioner wants a class on procedural justice. I said, what the heck is procedural justice? I've never even heard of that. I've heard about impartial policing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. What is procedural justice? He says, look it up. Uh, just go. Just give me a class. That's kind of what they do. That's what leaders do sometimes. They just go, I don't know. Just look it up. Go, go find out and do what you got to do. Okay, chief, I got you. So... I started to look into the work of Dr. Tom Taylor out of Yale. Since the early 90s, Dr. Taylor's been doing extensive research on procedural justice and police tactics, okay, and community relations. So I read every study he ever wrote. I read every article he ever contributed to. And I got to know this man inside and out. I read two of his books. And I also pulled a course from the Chicago Police Department. Okay, now the Chicago Police Department collaborated with the uh, University of Illinois, and they built the first really long version of a procedural justice class for law enforcement. Now, when my chief gave me this test, he said, you have three hours. We're going to put it on the back end of a training day. Three hours? Are you kidding me? I said, Chicago's class is like four days. He's like, no, 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 no. Three hours. I mean, three-hour block. So I built a three-hour block on procedural justice. Tom Taylor me now, and if you ever get to do this, Tom Taylor was like a rock star to me. When he called me, I was stuttering and I couldn't talk. You must know this feeling. You, you read all this wonderful work that someone's done in their field, and they've done it for the majority of their career, and then to have this person actually call you on the phone, I thought, this has got to be a mistake. This is amazing. Is this really you? And he says, yes. And I said, can I say something, sir? And he said, absolutely, Lieutenant. I said, you're like a rock star to me. And he said, that's so funny. <laughs> he just laughed on the phone. I said, I've read all of your work. I wrote a class based on all of your work. He was like, that's what I'm calling you about. I said, really? He says, yes. He says, I get asked all the time by police departments and law enforcement, do you have something you can give us that's encapsulated, something short, two or three hours tops? He says, and Karen, I read your class. I love it. Can I put it on my shelf? No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, you totally cannot use my class, Dr. Tom Taylor, rock star. So I was really, really honored that he called me and asked me if he could use my class and disseminate it out. Um, so that, too, okay, was just another small little thing. I could stand here all night long and tell you about things that have happened in my career that I was able to use my MPA degree for 
but you don't want to sit and listen to me all night. We have this wonderful guy who is happy to see you. So, if you're, is there, who's here just for an open house? Like, you're not in the program yet. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I was in your spot at one time. Um, and the rest of you are all in the program currently. <coughs> who's city, city government made, like, that's like where your focus is. City government? Yeah, yeah, cool. And the rest of you are nonprofit? Yeah, I'm faculty. Ah, oh, you're yeah. faculty? Yeah. Hello, sir, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, who are my, uh, my nonprofit folks? Nonprofit, great, great, great. Okay, so like I said, I kind of dabbled equally in both of them because I felt like I had the city government stuff down pretty much. So I really learned a lot in the nonprofit stuff. I really did. I think I brought a lot to the table. Another thing I like about the Villanova program is that if I'd have gone to St. Joe's or, some, or you know where all the cops were going to school, you don't get other perspectives. I really love that. I love that about Chestnut Hill actually, and I also love that about Villanova. Usually, I think all the time, Father Jacobs may be able to tell, I think I was the only cop in the classroom. He was the only person in law enforcement in the whole program at the time, at the time I was going. I had a lot of good friends, been a lot of wonderful people, but none of them were, you know, biased by the police junk. So that is another thing that I really, really loved about the program, such diversity. It's, and diversity is so wonderful when you're trying to learn and apply things and get new ideas and new perspectives. It, it, it's just, it's, it's an unrivaled thing. You, if you don't go into a program that offers some level of diversity, people coming from different organizations and different career paths and different life paths and different world views, you're missing out. You're missing out. You really are. And Villanova will give you that. Anybody have any questions? No? Great. You're <laughs> all of your experiences and how the MPA program has influenced them. So, we go. so next I want to input influence, now I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, Nick Tulo. Nick is from Chad's Ford, PA originally, and he graduated from Villanova in 2010 with a bachelor's in civil and environmental engineering. And then he went right into his MPA and graduated in 2012. He currently serves as the assistant dean of students here at Villanova University and he deals there with student conduct and other related student concerns. And before this current position, he worked in residence life where he dealt with daily management and operations of the residence halls. And he also currently serves as an adjunct MPA professor in strategic planning and analysis and research too. Um, and uh, also on the side, when he's not busy with all that other, uh, all, those, all those other operations, Nick, helps coordinate commencement and day of service here at Villanova, and he also teaches a leadership seminar to undergraduate students. So, okay, feel free to take that. Hi, everyone. So I'm not nearly as excited as Karen. I'm like, <laughs> I wish I went first, because I don't got any cool stories like that. Um, so I'm Nick Tumul, I'm the assistant dean of students at Villanova. Um, I am what many people here call a Villanova lifer. I have never left Villanova. I came here as a freshman, and I have been here ever since. Um, so I guess I'll start with how I sort of got to, to where I am, because you know, I work in student affairs um, as the assistant dean of students, but no one when they're growing up is like, I want to be a student affairs professional, you know, when I'm, when I'm, a, when I'm a grown up. Um, so, you know, I sort of got here um, by, by, you know, just happenstance, and, you know, I went to school for um, uh, civil and environmental engineering, and I actually was between being a political science major or being an engineer. Um, because I was sort of thought that I would be, you know, I was interested in both of those things, but I wanted to make money, so I decided to be an engineer. Now I work in education, so that didn't work out. Um, but uh, so, you know, I had this, these sort of, you know, really grandiose, you know, visions of what being an engineer was going to be like, and then I was going to be, um, you know, uh, building incredible infrastructure to change communities, and in many ways, engineers do do that. But as I got more into, you know, the program, you know, I loved. Um, all the math, I loved all the technical pieces, but I started to, you know, see a little bit more about what the profession was going to be, and I just realized that, that, you know, I didn't have the sense anymore that that was going to be fulfilling to me, and I started to get this, this sense, which I now realize was, was me being called, right, that, you know, I was supposed to be doing something else, and I, I had no idea what that thing was, and that, you know, I started to talk it out with 
the you know some some mentors that that I came to know here, and I said, you know, I'm, I, I I like the law, and you know, I think that I want to teach, and I think that you know, I, I don't I don't want to be just working with numbers and, and, and drawings. I want to be you know with people. And someone said to me, actually, a, a faculty member in the in the college of gym said to me, you need to go talk to someone named Dr. Christine Pallas, who at the time was the chairperson of the MPA program, and is now the, the dean of the College of Professional Studies. And I was a junior at the time, um, you know, thinking ahead to, you know, should I change my major? You know, I was getting kind of late in the game here, what am I going to do? And I went to talk to Dr. Pallas, and I kind of told her what, you know, what my, what my thought process was, you know, sort of what I was feeling, you know, being drawn towards. And she said, yeah, you're, you're talking about public service, and, and you're talking about, you know, being an educator. I was like, oh, is that is that what I'm talking about? Like, I, thank you, thank you for telling me. Just let me tell you about this thing called you know public administration um, that you might want to start thinking about. And you know, she kind of just opened my eyes to to that to that world. And she basically was always like, you know what, you're you are, are this far along, in, you know, as, as an engineer, you can basically do whatever you want with an engineering degree. Might as well stick it out, right? And then you'll figure it out later. And that's what I ended up doing. And you know, fast forward a year or so, and. Um, you know, at that point, I, I, I knew that I didn't want to be an engineer as I was approaching graduation. I did a bunch of internships and just realized, again, the profession wasn't, wasn't going to be for me. So I went back to Dr. Pallas and I said, you know, should I, should I go right back to grad school? Should I go right into the MPA program or should I go out and, and, you know, work somewhere? And she said, well, you know, the good thing about, she basically told me either way is the wrong decision, of course. But she you know, said, so the good thing about coming right into this program is it's gonna it's gonna help you figure out right what that calling is that you're trying to discern right now, right? Because I, I knew that I was supposed to do something, but I didn't know what it was. And she said this program is gonna help you figure that out. I was like, all right, let's do it. And you know, fast forward two years later, you know, uh, when I was approaching graduation, I had realized that I wanted to work in higher education. And I specifically realized that I wanted to work in higher education, not necessarily to be you know, a faculty member, not necessarily to, to, you know, fundraise for the program, but to be an administrator who is really, um, you know, working a, a sort of on, on the, all of the, the, um, the policies and the procedures, um, you know, that is associated with an institution of higher education. And, you know, I, I sort of found myself now, you know, a, a couple of years later doing exactly that. So, you know, my job as the dean of students, I oversee the whole student conduct process and I like to say in my office we really uh, deal with any non-academic issue right so anything that's going on outside of the classroom my office deals with so whether it be student conduct whether it be personal concerns that students are experiencing you know we you know my office is, is taking care of that but as you know the person that's overseeing the student conduct process I also get to you know oversee all of the policies and procedures that are not academic that are associated with how the university functions and how students uh, learn and develop here, and you know at the same time while I'm adjudicating adjudicating cases and and you know many times feel like I'm almost working in, in the legal setting. I am I'm educating right because at the core of what we do is this is an educational process. So I really found myself in a position where all of these interests that I had back when I was an undergraduate are are, are all coming together. You know law and and public policy and education um, and. Um, you know, it, it's just, it, it's been, like, it's been completely, you know, shocking to me how I found myself doing what I'm doing and actually um, living out all those things that I was interested in, you know, and I never even knew it uh, to begin with. And, and really, the MPA program, you know, helped me discern what that calling was, that I wanted to work in higher education, particularly um, in student affairs, um, you know, with with young people who are you know who are, who are learning and, and who are growing. Um, you know, I, one thing that really struck me that, that Karen said that was a, a huge takeaway for her was was the, you know sort of the communication piece, the, the the writing skills, right? And I think back to you know what has has made me help do my job so well, um, or at least I think I do it well, is um, you know the fact that I feel very confident in being a communicator. And because I feel confident in being a communicator, I feel confident that I can be an influencer. And when you work with college students, being an influencer is pretty important, especially in what I'm trying to do. Because what I'm trying to do, right, is get students to understand the impact that they're having on themselves and on the community, right? Which I actually think is very public servant 
ish, right? Is to think about the impact that they're having on themselves in the community. You know, because the conversations I have every day with students is, you know, hey, I see you're doing you're doing great in the classroom. You know, clearly on top of, of your studying, you have a strong GPA. But are you being a positive and contributing member of this community? Right? There's more. There's more to coming to school. Right? There's more to society than just doing well in one particular area. Right? Than just doing well in your job or at school. Right? It's about having that impact on the community. And you know, I, I feel like a lot of what I what I took away for the from the MPA program is again the ability to communicate that that motivation and to influence in that way. You know why that's important. Why that matters. Um, you know, another thing that that has been helpful for me is, and many of you might experience this, whether working in nonprofit or, or government, you know, higher education institutions, Villanova, and, and really many, many different um, organizations, you know, at its core are mission and values driven, right? But more and more, we find ourselves having to also navigate so much um, compliance and regulation um, and litigation. And, you know, every, every day I ask myself, you know, are we doing our job of being a mission values driven educational institution when it feels like we are serving um, the, you know, sometimes we're serving all of the regulation and the compliance that, you know, that, that higher education institutions have to deal with. And, you know, I think back to my time, you know, in the MPA, MPA program and, and how, you know, it's not about these things, right, clashing, right, it's about these things working together and why they're, why they're all important. Right? Why regulation is important? Why mission and values is important? You know, why oversight is important? Why, um, you know, it, it sort of educational um, uh, uh, perspectives are important? Um, you know, uh, Karen mentioned it was procedural justice, right? A very big buzzword in um, student conduct is, is this idea of restorative justice, right? Which is, um, I guess to summarize, it, it's it's not so much. Um, you know, sort of the old school punitive, um, you know, uh, you do this and this is your outcome, you know, and it's, it's probation or suspension or fines or, you know, sort of those more, those more uh, punitive um, consequences, but rather it's the idea of repairing any harms that you have done um, to, you know, either yourself or, or your community, um, whether that be through mediation or, or through service or through educational opportunities. Um, which I love that, that that student conduct is sort of moving in that direction, but then at the same time, you know, we are in a society right now where there are certain things which, you know, um, you want to be able to educate students on things um, like bias-related incidents, things like sexual assault and, and Title IX and, and various things where, you know, you want to be able to use these as educational oppor opportunities to better students, right? But what we're working with, the, you know, against, or I suppose what is making that difficult um, is is the, the current climate that we're in that if you do not respond in a certain way, right, which tends to be much more punitive, right, then, you know, that's, the, you have to sort of deal with what, what those outcomes are. And, you know, so you have one side of the coin that's saying you need to be restorative in, in your justice, you need to be educational, you need to be motivational, right, but then you have the other side of the coin that says you, these people are, are hopeless. Right? These people, you know, they don't, they do not deserve to be educated. They do not deserve, um, you know, to, to, to have any um, ability to repair or that opportunity for restorative justice. So, you know, it's sort of those clashing interests, right? And again, it's thinking back to the MPA program is, okay, where is the overlap, right? And how do you build the collaborations and the understanding um, to, to make those things work together? Um, so again, you're still accomplishing what your mission and your values are telling you to accomplish, right? But still serving, um, you know, the the uh, you know society that you what you have to in terms of you know legal requirements and and all those pieces. So um, yeah, you know the the I guess some of the, the other biggest takeaways that, that I have, especially with some of the, the prospective students here, is. What really set me up for success is, is you know, that, that I was just fortunate enough to, to find some incredible mentors. And I guess the, the piece of advice that I, that I have to give is spend some extra time finding some good mentors. Because it was mentorship 
that helped me understand what I was supposed to do. And it was mentorship that helped me understand um, how I want to do it, right? And, um, you know, I think what makes Villanova, the MPA program, special is this idea of, of relationship building and, and forming connections where that mentorship isn't just with the faculty members, but it's with the other people in your classroom, you know, who are coming from such diverse experiences. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, it really, I think at its core, it just, it, you know, especially someone who did not have a career before I went into the program, it helped me understand what I, what I wanted to do. So the discernment um, was probably my biggest takeaway. And I think it was through mentorship from both my you know, faculty members and, and my peers um, that, that got me to where, where I am today, where I really am doing all the things that I didn't know I wanted to do, you know, back when I was a wee lad. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of all I got for right, for right now. I'm sure we're gonna have time for questions or anything, but I don't need to go on any, any more. So thank you very much. Are you still involved at all with the police department and the Narcan? I'm not, but, I, but I'm not. Um, but I'm on uh, faculty at the Montgomery County Community College Police Academy. So we're doing some instruction there with them, and they don't have anybody else there right now. Because I can tell you, Montgomery County Police, uh, Montgomery County Community College Police Academy, they train. Okay, they go through an academic program, and then they get hired by departments all over the Commonwealth. When they go out to those other departments, those department's chiefs expect them to be trained on the administration of naloxone. Oh. So, yeah, they okay. get it with us. Oh, okay. So I still do it a little bit. An extension up. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, Bridget. It's been a long time since we've been in class together. I know. Um, Bridget and I were project teammates I together. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, you were called to be police officer. I don't know if you addressed it, maybe I missed it, but what exactly drew you to become a police officer? At what point was there an epiphany moment or just kind of an evolution? Um, well, when when I graduated from John W. Hallahan High School out of Summer City, Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> you the did you go to Halloween? No, my grandmother did. Oh, so did my grandma. So, <laughs> so I went to Halloween. I graduated in 1987. I'm not afraid to date myself. I turned 50 in March. I'm so proud of it. Um, so I graduated from high school. I, when I came out of high school, I actually right this. Came out of high school and I went to Temple University, and I majored in theatrical arts. Who knew that all these years later, I would love to get up in front of folks like yourself <laughs> and just blah, 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 blah. Um, so I majored in theatrical arts because in high school, I was the lead role in every high school play for four years straight. So went into Temple, and what I found was my parents were not rich. I told you my father was a police officer. He never made rank. He was a cop in the 14th police district for 27 years. Um, my mother went to LaSalle College, it was college when she went through undergrad, but she worked for um, Women's Medical College in East Falls, if you're familiar with that. Um, and she since went on to work for University of Penn, but my parents were not wealthy. So my mother and father did not have the ability to pay for me to go to college when I graduated from Halley. I was on my own. So I got into Temple and I got a little bit of student aid and I found myself working three jobs to try and pay for school. I wound up working as a legal secretary for an attorney in Maniunk. Uh, worked for him for about a year. Um, lived at the Temple Ambler campus for a little while. To make a long story short, I sat down at my table, my mother and father's kitchen table with my dad. Okay, God rest his soul, he died last year. Um, sat down and had a real heart to heart at the age of 19, almost 20 with my pop. And I said, Dad, this was a crossword, crossroads watershed conversation in my life. And I actually spoke about this at his funeral. So I didn't know what I was doing. 
I had no idea what I was doing. I said, I, I, I'm, I'm running out of money for school. I don't like the dorms I'm living in. I'm, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay for an apartment. I was just a mess. 19 and a mess. I can't be the only one in this room who was either 18, 19, or 20 and just a hot mess. <laughs> and I needed some guidance. And my father said, I have a suggestion for you. And I said, what's that? So he had a piece of paper under the Daily News, and he lifts up the Daily News, he takes a piece of paper, and he slides it across the table. And I look at it, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, I've been holding that for three weeks to give it to you in case this conversation came up. It was an application to the Philadelphia Police Department. Now, my father was a cop. Now, I lived with my mother and I, not knowing if he was coming home, uh, when I was very young, at the age of nine, an officer that he worked with by the name of Officer Gary Farrell was shot and killed in the line of duty in the 14th Police District, and there was a lot of camaraderie there. I saw the pain and struggle my father went through when that death happened. Becoming a police officer was never on my agenda. But you know what? I didn't know what else to do. I really was at that point in my life where I just had no direction. I had no idea where my life was going to be a year from now. So what the heck? Filled out the application. Literally a month later, I'm standing in line at Girls High to take the test. And about three months after that, they did my background investigation. Back, back in the early 90s, they were doing background investigations very quickly. Okay? And, all, and if you, literally, if you went through Catholic school, you're almost a shoe in So, went through the background process. And next thing you know, I, I actually, I told you I was working for an attorney in Manion. I had a, a job offer on the table making really good money for a, to be a legal secretary for a guy in Plymouth meeting. His office is still there. He's right on German tail pike. He calls me up and he says, come in for your interview. I go for my interview. He says, I'll call you, I'll call you, I'll call you. I come home from the interview and hand to God. The envelope from the Philadelphia Police Department is shoved under my door and I open up the envelope. Now I had just come from my interview with this attorney. Open up the envelope, congratulations, be at the police academy on such and such a date. I'm like, hey! I, I get done reading all these documents, and my phone rings, and it's the lawyer saying, do you want the job? I'm like, wow, I've got two job offers in one day. So, for the last time that ever happened. Um, but that is how I came into law enforcement. And sometimes careers happen that way. And like I told you, the police, it does. It just happens. It's just the way life works sometimes. You didn't plan for it. You didn't study for it. It just happened. Yeah, so my grandfather was a Philadelphia police officer, but he did not go to Halloran. <laughs> Halloran? <laughs> Halloran's all girls. Oh, all girls, I see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Roman <laughs> Catholic is our brother school. He went to LaSalle High School. So. Okay. But, uh, the, um, but I'm struck by, you know, here's Narcan, you know, wonderful product. I mean, you're probably responsible for saving dozens of lives. No, I'm not personally with the cops but, I trained, yes. But, you, you, I mean, you got the funding for it. Yet, you know, I, I, I think the crux of the issue is, like, still, like, how do you convince these, these government bureaucrats to change, right? I mean, here's this wonderful program. You can show the return on investment. It still was not a line item. You had to go out and get the money yourself. Mm -hmm. That's a big, big problem. Yes, probably a five hundred million dollar budget for the Philadelphia Police, and they couldn't carve out hundred thousand dollars for this. Even Harrisburg was shoveling money into Philadelphia for this. Yeah, uh, private private sector was giving us money. Um, NGOs like the Tuttleman Foundation was giving us money. Um, the State District Attorney's Office funneled money into the Philly PD for Narcan. Um, a lot of different organizations were really, really the DEA. And these were, a lot of this was through connections that I had made in my law enforcement career. Just reaching out and saying, hey, do you know anything about like Narcan funding or is any, I would call my my counterpart, the Pittsburgh Police Department. Um, all of my training stuff, I've had to deal with Pittsburgh a lot. I'm actually on a lesson plan committee with them now. But I would call as far as Pittsburgh. Dallas was calling me saying, how do you pay for this? I'm like, good luck. For. You know, my only uh, follow-up was, was it politics or the, uh, the fire rescue guys probably didn't want to give that up, maybe? No, no, no. Uh, we, we actually got a little bit of resistance from the Philly Fire Department at first. Um, when our first Narcan hit the street, I had cops calling me up saying, this is really a horrible story, but I'll share it with you anyway. Police officer goes on scene, they administer Narcan, the fire medics show up and they go, what did you do? And they go, we gave them Narcan. And they said, oh, well, I guess you got this then and got back in their truck and left. 
So I immediately, when I got wind of this, I get right on the phone with the chief of EMS and I said, yeah, we got a problem. Your medics cannot do that, okay? That is a major, major liability to the city, okay? They have a patient. They're, I'm teaching my cops, as soon as medics get there, they assume all medical care of this patient. They have a higher level of training, they have better equipment, they have better resources. You stand down and let them now treat the patient. You will give them all information, but they are to assume responsibility for that patient. How am I teaching this when your medics are gonna pull up and because they're angry, because our cops are treating people, I can tell you that stopped just like that because I wasn't happy. But funding for Narcan, do a little math in your head real quick. Somebody gives somebody a, a dose of Narcan, $40 I told you, $37.50 to be exact. Actually by now it's probably $40, okay? One dose. Let's say the officer in the light of fentanyl and car fentanyl and all the things that they're putting in the heroin supply, I'm going to tell you, I've had officers use six and seven and eight doses of naloxone on one victim. Tally that up. Now, I, not only that, I have to replace that officer's Narcan. So it's one and done. I can't refill the atomizer. Now I've got to give them all new Narcan. Now they use that. I've got to re replace that. And then they use that. I've got to replace that. So every time an officer uses it, you've got to give them another one. So that bill never stops. It never stops. In 2016, we had over 900 deaths in Philadelphia from drug overdoses. In 2017, I believe they calculated 1,200 deaths from overdoses. That's like three times our homicide rate in Philadelphia. Like this opioid problem is out of control. Out of control. I can tell you I've spoken in front of medical boards, medical conferences in Philadelphia and New Jersey. I've spoken at, um, national EMS conferences for naloxone in law enforcement, I get the same questions from doctors. How are police paying for it? I said, on a shoestring. That's really how we're paying for it. The command structure of law enforcement, not just in Philadelphia, but in other places, have this very grand idea, we're gonna put this big public health effort forward. This is a great tool to put in the hands of cops. But as I learned here at, in Villanova, actually, before you establish a public policy like that, you have to do cost-benefit analysis. You have to figure out how you're going to pay for this. Is there going to be a tax subsidy? What, what's going to be the mechanism for funding this program? Guess what? They missed that in class when they sat in that class, my commanders. Okay, they, For some reason, they didn't listen to that. So when I posed it to them, and I got frustrated at many, many, many command meetings, because I gave them a variety of ways that they could curtail the cost of naloxone, they were very insistent. No, we want every cop to have Narcan. You can have every cop have Narcan. But you don't need to put two doses of Narcan in the hands of all 6,000 police officers. So they said, Lieutenant, what do you suggest? And I said, well, at roll call every day, police officers come on the street, they have to sign out a police radio. Why not have them sign out a Narcan back? Rather than having 450 bags of naloxone floating around a police district, just put 50. They go out on the street, sign out the bag, go out on, go out on the street with your bag. When you report off duty, bring it back in. The next shift coming in takes the same bag there. I said that to the police inspector at East Division. He goes, oh my goodness, why are we not doing this? And I said, I don't know, sir. You would have to ask the police commissioner. So, I mean, I, I, I Villanova gave me these great strategies. I take them to my bosses, and they're just like, I'm like pushing a, a you know, a boulder up a hill. But yeah, yeah paying for it's a struggle. Sense. Yeah, yeah. People have it. it is common sense, absolutely. Sir? So Karen and Nick, since you were just talking about the things you learned at Villanova while you were here, uh -huh. could you share with those individuals that are thinking of coming what classes really kind of influence you the most? And let Father Jacob's presence not be an <laughs> 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 organizational theorist. <laughs> for me, strategic planning was a really uh, impactful class for me. And, and, and upon reflection, especially, um, you know, the, working at, a, at an institution like Villanova, and again, I'm sure many of you can understand, it, 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 it is, they are so complicated, these, these organizations, right? So to, um, be able to think about, you know, still advancing um, 
you know, your uh, sort of vision and, and your ideas and, you know, your strategies um, among these incredibly complicated, um, complex organizations, you know, is something that you know, I really come to appreciate on, on both a micro level and a macro level. And, you know, the, the sort of understanding that strategic planning is not just about sort of what, what you know, what you think of originally with strategic planning of, of, the, of senior leadership, you know, thinking about where the organization is going to go as a whole in the next 20 years, but it's also on a very small level um, within your own role and how you can be strategic about, you know, about the, the influence that you have. Um, so that, you know, I really took away a lot from that class and I'm actually really fortunate to teach that class now. Um, so really, you know, any of the cl any classes, I'm actually one of the probably Jane Tubbs, it's not just because this year, uh, <laughs> that, that really, you know, gets to uh, understanding of organizational dynamics and, and all those pieces. Uh, I actually learned a lot in my um, uh, nonprofit courses, a whole lot. I learned a lot about nonprofit theory. I was able to have a really great understanding of the nonprofit sector and the struggles they go through uh, because one, having that knowledge, first of all, when I got it, I thought I'm never going to use this, never going to use it. But then I got involved in this opioid thing and I was, I literally immersed myself in the nonprofit sector. And I was so thrilled. I thought, wow, you know, God really does have a plan. I'm telling you, it is, it is the truth. I never thought I would use that material. I actually found myself going back to some of my nonprofit theorists and reading up so that when I talk to these, you know, NGO folks, I didn't sound like a babbling idiot. I like, I, like I know what I'm talking about. I actually studied this stuff. This is cool. I'm glad to be down in the dirt, you know, working this stuff with you guys and figuring out your problems and how police and the NGOs can work together to try and combat this social issue. Um, not that really, my NGO classes were really, really in instrumental in using that in my career. Um. Nick, I really like what you said about uh, working in higher ed. That was kind of where the public service bug bit me was in higher ed. And what would you say for each of you, how would you, in like a sentence or two, uh, encapsulate what public service is to each of you? I think going back to, to what I said originally, it is, it's motiv motivating others to be positive and contributing members of, of the community. In, in whatever way that looks like. I mean, that you know, I think I feel like you can apply that to, to anything, to any any field. But that's what it is to me. It's and, and in turn, I'm, I'm motivating myself to you know be a positive and contributing member of, of, of the community. Um, and that's that's sort of how I go how I go about my job and how I think of public service. I totally agree with you, Nick. Um, I can tell you that for me, public service is about justice and truth. Um, and that if you are in public service and you're not um, motivated by justice and truth and, and, and just the basics of helping other people, putting other people's well-being above your own, then public service isn't for you. Um, it's not about profit. Yeah, it, it's just not. You know, we, we work in a revenue world in public service, so it's very, very different. It's about where those funds are going to be allocated to help other people live better lives. Um, I lived in a 28-year career of everybody, regardless of who they are, wants to let their kids play outside, and they want to be able to have a safe home, and they want to have a safe neighborhood, and they want to be able to have their property not be destroyed or infiltrated by people who are not welcome to do so. Um, again, it's all about just having that whole part of your being about helping other people. Question for Nick. Uh, when you graduated from the program, did you immediately start working here? What was your career path to now you're the assistant dean? Yeah, so students? right after graduation and um, before I was in the, before the student's office, I was in residence life, so I oversaw the residence halls on campus. So everything from um, uh, you know the, the sort of more logistical operations of facilities and, and, and those pieces to um, you know, housing assignments to supervision of the residence hall staff. Um, so, uh, yeah, I did that for just under four years before I moved into, into this position. So you were like a cop, too. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That was all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Right, I 
I supervise the RA staff in that job. Thank you all so much for attending this evening's event. I want to especially recognize and thank our panelists, and thank you for your commitment to public service and for sharing your stories with us, and of course for your support of Villanova's chapter of Pi Alpha Alpha. Please feel free to network and chat with one another and stay for refreshments, and um, as soon as people want around maybe 8 p.m., we're gonna head out to Galipti's and all are welcome to join. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.